The Vision of Fanon. When I first read the writings of Franz Fanon, I was stymied by them. Perhaps 15 years old, I couldn't grasp its nuances, its careful mastery of its psychological projections and analyses. What came through this teenager's mind was its intense anti-colonialism and the determination of the Algerian nationalists and the Algerian people to fight the foreigners, the colons, the settlers' unbridled cruelty, unchecked racism, and an exploitative spirit that sought to crush not just the people, but their very culture, history, religion, and their sense of nationhood. In perhaps his finest work, The Wretched of the Earth, Fanon utilizes his professional expertise as doctor, psychiatrist, and ethno-psychologist to analyze the settler state, and in his diagnoses, he pronounces the colony, its mother country, and indeed Europe itself, suffers from a malady of madness profound xenophobia expressed through its political, economic, cultural, religious, and military forces. It is ill of racism, greed, and rapaciousness, and it protects its ill-gotten gains through violence, torture, and terror. For a young militant in the 60s, reading Fanon was reading not just brilliance, but rawness, realness, resistance, revolution. If this was all that Fanon did, it would seal his place in anti-imperial history, but of course, it was not. In the latter parts of the work, Fanon takes an equally close examination of the neo-colonial state, and although his analyses took place in the middle of the 20th century, his diagnosis seems not merely brilliant, but prophetic, for he all but predicts the disasters of late 20th century Africa, a continent groaning under the greed and avariciousness of a slew of African leaders who, students of Europe, have continued the policies of exploitation, of colonialism. It's just that they now partake in the kleptocracy. They are less national leaders than shared thieves, for the nation's economy becomes their personal purse. They are less representative of their people than agents of the international capitalist class who pay them to do their bidding. Fanon, in The Wretched of the Earth, decries the rise of African bourgeoisie as a force not for national empowerment, but of national impoverishment. Fanon writes, the national bourgeoisie, which has totally assimilated colonialist thought in its most corrupt form, takes over from the Europeans and establishes in the continent a racial philosophy which is extremely harmful for the future of Africa. Although writing years before the passing of the colonial era, Fanon's warning presaged the horrors of national disasters to come, such as the genocide between Tutsi and Hutu, the black Arab carnage in Sudan, the tribal battles raging in Kenya, the Hausa Yoruba conflicts in Nigeria, and the like. Fanon predicted that national bourgeoisie and the political agents, politicians that they hired, would manipulate and exploit ethnic and religious divisions to divide and divert populations and thereby weaken them from forming multi-ethnic and mass political movements. Fanon, again in The Wretched of the Earth, diagnosed the problem thusly, quote, from nationalism, we have passed to ultra-nationalism, to chauvinism, and finally to racism, unquote. Fanon foresaw Rwanda, Sudan, South Africa and beyond if national and continental leadership did not seriously strive for intercommunal unity. They did not, and thereby unleashed a bloody flood of horrors. If Fanon's voice had been heeded, Africa's great millions would have been spared decades of disaster, dislocation, indignity, and death. But as we all know, his voice, no matter how prescient, was not heeded. And we are all where we are, here. It is in this spirit that I am honored to accept the Fanon Award presented by the Fondation Fanon, a body which works to teach Fanon's works and to try to have impact on the present, not the past. I am honored because Dr. Franz Fanon was not merely a doctor, a psychiatrist, an ethno-psychologist, essayist, editor, journalist, and anti-torture worker. 
Fanon was a revolutionary. He slept four-hour nights and used every ounce of his energy to give life to the anti-colonial struggle. He could have lived a long and splendid life as a Martina Khan, living and working in the imperial capital, but he could not. In Bulhan's fine book, France Fanon and the Psychology of Oppression, we learn of Fanon's remarkable response when, as a young doctor, he saw his colleagues, other French doctors, using janitors and others to translate patients' Arabic into French and vice versa. Fanon found this an intolerable violation of doctor-patient confidentiality, as well as humiliating to patients. Fanon's response was as unique as it was humanitarian. He studied and learned Arabic so that he could converse with his patients at Blida Hospital in Algeria. His fellow professionals took umbrage at this move and labeled him Le Médecin Nègre, or Dr. Nigger. Such insults didn't bother Fanon in the slightest. He had work to do and little time to do it. Ill, exhausted, he rose from his sickbed to fight the fight that would not wait. In one of his last letters, he wrote to a friend, Monsieur Roger Tayeb, the following. We are nothing on earth if we're not, in the first place, the slaves of a cause, the cause of the peoples, the cause of justice and liberty. I want you to know that even when the doctors had given me up in the gathering dusk, I was still thinking of the Algerian people, of the peoples of the third world, and when I have persevered, it was for their sake. Madame de Monsieur, mes amis de Fondation Fanon, voici est le révolutionnaire, Monsieur le Docteur France Fanon. Je me suis très honoré avec la satisfaction dans la Fondation. Merci, mes amis. Pour la vive de Fanon, vive Fanon, dans la nation imprisonnée, ici, is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio.